to, oh. All right, bear with me here. I'm not moving through the slides very well. Okay. Uh, so I have no disclosures. We also have no, no cases and no clinics. So we have to give, give lectures. Um, but this is our hospital down in Atlanta. I work with Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So we're a relatively large system that's four campuses, uh, about 650 beds overall, and about 300 of those are at my hospital. Be sure to keep them. So uh, we'll go through a touch of background and then through some different conditions that do require surgical and peds, and then spend the last part of the lecture really focusing on the pediatric thyroid guidelines. So quick embryology review. I think y'all are familiar with development of the thyroid gland and that it needs to descend into its final position to the neck. That obviously gives rise to some of our surgical procedures when we're discussing thyroglossal duct cysts. Won't spend a whole lot of time on that today. Uh, but I think it is good to remember that it is functional in the uh, fetus and embryo. And so, you know, that is important for normal physiologic development of the baby and has implications for patients with congenital hypothyroidism. And then the other thing that's good to remember is that there are multiple different origins for the thyroid cells. And um, that also has some implications for later pathology that we see. In terms of the functioning of the gland, uh, we know that the hormones it secretes are primarily bound to plasma proteins. A very small percentage of them are actually free uh, in the bloodstream. T3 is the more active form, whereas T4 is the more plentiful form. Uh, and symptoms of hormone level derangement can be some of those classic symptoms of hyper and hypothyroidism that we learn about in school, but also can be some sort of more vague symptoms that can go along with um, chronic pain or chronic fatigue type presentations. Uh, and that's uh, important to keep in mind in kids as well. And then we also know that normal thyroid hormone levels are important for normal maturation of the central nervous system, as well as bone development, muscle development, uh, and even lung development in young children. So when we look at how we can diagnose thyroid issues, I think it's um, nice to just, from a surgical standpoint, kind of think about a toolkit that includes your history and physical, labs, imaging, and biopsy. Um, I think um, when we go through some of these things, you may be more or less likely to order different tests, but as a surgeon, it's okay to order labs. Um, we don't need them very often, but a uh, TSH and T4 can really guide some of your management if a patient presents to you before they've seen an endocrinologist. And then when it comes to imaging, just remember to use caution with iodinated contrast. Um, in adults, we're used to looking at CT scans of the neck for most pathology, and in kids, um, we tend to move away from that. So uh, a lot of a combination of ultrasound and MRI when needed, but for thyroid to remember that ultrasound really is the first line imaging of choice. We'll get into some concerns related to FNA a little bit later, but hopefully at most of your institutions, you are seeing utilization of FNA in children. Um, again, that in the past has sometimes not been used, but really is in accordance with the current guidelines for pediatric care. So why do we need this talk? Um, I think uh, important to remember that management of thyroid disease in children is not the same as it is in adults, and that has to do with both the prevalence of pathology within thyroid nodules in children and um, their response to treatment and, and the long-term implications of their treatment. So, um, you know, if you haven't made yourself familiar with the 2015 pediatric guidelines for no uh, thyroid nodule care, that is a great thing to review. And keep in mind, the uh, revision of those guidelines should be coming out very soon. Uh, but that has really sort of changed the way that we take care of kids in this country. Um, you know, nodules in adults are overwhelmingly benign, but in kids, up to a quarter of them might be malignant. So we just need to take care of them in a slightly different way. Um, also important 
for when you are educating your patient's family members because a lot of adults will know someone who's been treated for thyroid disease. It's relatively common amongst adults. But again, if they're treating their child, it's gonna be treated in a different way. So our objectives today will be to go through some of the common con congenital anomalies of the thyroid gland, uh, talk about how to appropriately work up a nodule in a pediatric patient, um, know when to think about surgery, and then uh, get a good understanding of what the risks are in children. So we'll take a case-based approach from here on out. So the first thing we're gonna go over is a six-year-old girl with lingual thyroid. So this patient was diagnosed with hypothyroidism based on her newborn screen and supplemented with levothyroxine until about age three uh, and then trialed off of medication. So that's a really common course in children with congenital hypothyroidism. They're typically supplemented through their toddler years and then trialed off medication to see if they have uh, a gland that will function adequately on its own. So she had had an ultrasound already uh, at birth that showed a thyroid gland, a small gland, but showed a gland in the fossa. And they had weaned her medications and around um, age five, she presented with a visible lump in the back of her tongue. So when she came to see me at age six, the reason for that was new onset of snoring and some mild dysphagia. She wasn't having any trouble actually getting her food down, but just kind of complaining that it felt weird to swallow and avoiding some chewier foods like meats and things like that. So a lingual thyroid looks a lot like this picture. You know, it's kind of a rubbery mass. It almost looks like a third tonsil back there, except it tends to have this sort of lacy overlying vasculature that you can see here. Um, they're relatively rare. Um, they do have a female preponderance, pardon me, and we can see enlargement brought on by different life stages. So puberty, pregnancy, menopause, some people say even stress can cause enlargement. Um, but they tend to be diagnosed a little bit later in life because of that. Oftentimes they're not noticed immediately. So this is the most common location for ectopic thyroid tissue, that means functioning tissue. Uh, and in about 70% of patients, it will be their only thyroid tissue. So uh, much in the same way we talk about thyroid glossal duct cysts, it's a failure of proper migration of the thyroid cells from the foramen cecum farther down into the neck. Uh, and you can have functioning tissue that's left behind at one or more locations, although the tongue is the most common. So one thing you want to differentiate it from is a molecular cyst. Uh, a molecular cyst will usually be sort of pale, um, pinkish or almost bluish in coloration, and it has a sort of transparent or a translucent look to it with the mucinous fluid inside. These are more commonly diagnosed in the neonatal or infant period, um, and and tend to cause some pretty profound dysphagia or obstructive symptoms for patients. Thyroglossal duct cysts can, in the, well, when they're in the vollecula, can be challenging to differentiate from a vollecular cyst. Um, but you would differentiate that from lingual thyroid based on the fact that it is cystic uh, and then it is inert, right? This uh, thyroglossal duct cyst, by definition, does not have active thyroid tissue in it. Um, so the present presenting symptoms typically would be a visible mass, maybe dysphagia, and kids or adults, new onset snoring or obstructive symptoms. And then there's a chance of having compressive symptoms. That's relatively unusual. So this is a T1-weighted MRI. You can see there's a well-circumscribed lesion in the vollecula just anterior to the epiglottis. It's kind of iso-intense with the tongue, right? So as an ENT, you would be looking at physical exam. Uh, you want to consider an ultrasound, make sure there is a gland in the fossa. Sometimes there won't be. Nuclear medicine scan is not something that I typically order, uh, although you may get a referral to a patient who's already had it done, especially if you have a gland in addition to the lingual thyroid tissue. And you would just see the activity concentrated in the oropharynx rather than in the anterior neck where you expect. 
so these patients all need a TSH. Uh, not a, a minority of them are clinically hypo, hypothyroid, but the majority will be um, hypothyroid based on lab evaluation. So uh, we also need that evaluation for other thyroid tissue. And then when it comes to intervention, really the primary driver of inter a need for intervention is going to be symptoms. So um, in kids, this picture can get muddied a little bit by normal age appropriate uh, symptoms that could be related to adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And so that was actually a sort of a treatment dilemma in this patient. She had relatively large tonsils. Um, and there's some question of whether her snoring had come from enlargement of the tonsils and adenoids versus actual enlargement of the thyroid tissue there. Uh, in terms of surgical approach, certainly transoral approaches are more common now, I would say, um, given our um, ability to use CO2 laser or um, other endoscopic instruments, but you can approach these externally if necessary. And then, like we talked about, the questions that you would want to ask are, is there other functioning thyroid tissue, or is the patient going to be staying on or needing postoperative suppression? Uh, if you have a patient who's dependent upon some levothyroxine for suppression, then maybe surgery is not such a big deal because they're, you know, they're already dependent on that supplemental hormone. Um, if they are not and they have you know, good function of their lingual thyroid tissue, then you might be more inclined to observe them. When I was in training, I was, you know, certainly counseled on this risk for, you know, the, the idea that you need to do surgery because there's a risk of malignancy in the lingual thyroid tissue and that you wouldn't be able to monitor for that very well. Um, that's true, but very, very uncommon. And so I think in most cases, we would not consider the potential risk for future malignancy as a reason to operate. Um, it is important to discuss with your patients if you're going ahead with surgery, the chance for postoperative dysphagia, because you have a space occupying lesion there in the vollecula that's really going to change the way that liquids route over the back of the tongue uh, and kind of down into the hypopharynx. So there could be some temporary dysphagia afterwards. Um, most of the time that does resolve relatively quickly as the contour of the posterior tongue um, evens out after surgery. So we've got a six-year-old with a known lingual thyroid, a small gland in the fossa that does not appear to be functioning very well, that's already on levothyroxine with new snoring and dysphagia. What are we going to do? So she had a multidisciplinary evaluation. We decided to increase her synthroid dose. Um, and get an MRI to really look at the full extent of the lesion. That's the MRI that you saw. She was not able to sit for a flexible laryngoscopy and it was a little too big to hold. So that's what we looked at her with imaging. Uh, on that regimen, her, the size of her gland was stable over more than 12 months. Uh, her snoring did resolve and she remains on suppression right now. Um, her, T, her TSH is just below normal, but she's not clinically hyperthyroid. Uh, and so she is doing fine just with her medications. And I think over the surveillance period, her tonsils have decreased in size a little bit as well. So hopefully she's out of the window for requiring surgery. Uh, if anybody has questions or comments as we go along, you can send them to me via the little chat links, but otherwise I'll just kind of keep going, okay? So we're going to move on to a 15-year-old that's had some recurrent left neck abscesses. Uh, so this was a patient that presented to me with a history of eight prior surgical procedures for abscesses in the neck. She'd had multiple INDs. She'd had two surgeries that were dictated as second brinchial cleft excisions and one prolonged hospital stay after a debridement with um, wound packing to try to make this area heal by secondary intention. At the time of presentation, she had a little eight millimeter wound kind of down at the level of the cricoid with um, a tiny little finger of granulation tissue sticking out and some straw colored drainage. She would just keep that covered with a Band-Aid, uh, but then periodically when it would swell, she said it would get quite large, about the size of mandarin orange. 
Uh, she's never had any endocrine symptoms, never had any swelling dysfunction, and at the time of presentation really had no palpable mass in the area. So certainly in a patient like this, you're concerned for a piriform sinus fistula. Um, these are sometimes referred to as third and fourth branchial cleft anomalies. Uh, we'll go through that a little bit in a, in a moment. Um, but they're classically low in the neck and classically associated with the left side of the thyroid, oftentimes not palpable until there is an active infection. So on here, you can see the thyroid. Do you all see my um, cursor? or mouse, everybody's probably on mute. Um, but you have the thyroid gland labeled as well as the trachea, and you see this abscess cavity with the asterisk um, right here between the SCM and the strap muscles, which is a really typical location. So in her case, we have to think about the developmental anatomy of the neck, right? Oh, sorry. Um, I know you've all studied your branchial arches and their derivatives. And I think when it comes to the branchial cleft anomalies, for me at least, the easiest way to remember them is just to remember the associated nerve and then understand that the anomaly is going to run deep to the nerve and structures innervated by that same arch and superficial to the higher level arches, right? So a third cleft or um, arch anomaly is going to run deep to cranial nerve nine and its associated structures and superficial to the fourth arch structures. Um, because third and fourth arch um, anomalies are so rare and because they rarely present with the full course of the, of the anomaly sort of looping down into the mediastinum and back superiorly, we kind of moved away from differentiating them between third and fourth arch and just lumped the two of them together as piriform sinus fistulas, since both of them will enter into it and exit into the piriform. So piriform sinuses are these sort of pyramidal shaped uh, areas at the back side of the larynx, the hypopharynx, that serve as part of the funneling mechanism for food and liquids during swallowing. So at the, what you see in these patients is at the inferior portion, not just this sort of blind pouch, but an actual opening, a fistulous tract that extends down into the neck. Right, sorry, so they're passively collapsed except during swallowing. And when your epiglottis flips down uh, and the larynx raises up during that swallowing mechanism, that's gonna send the liquids over the top of the epiglottis into the piriforms and then down the esophagus. Sorry, I'm a little repeating there. Um, so presentation for these anomalies, you also often have a recurrent separative thyroiditis or recurrent thyroid abscesses. Um, any patient, certainly pediatric patient with a history of recurrent procedures for neck abscesses is someone to consider. And then this is what this patient had, which is the real kind of tip off, is she had a bunch of oral bacteria on her prior abscess um, cultures, right? So if you're getting oral bacteria down in the low neck, then you know there's got to be a connection there somewhere. So you have, again, your sort of toolkit of imaging options. I, you know, in the absence of an active abscess, I find ultrasound not particularly helpful for these because you tend not to be able to track the lesion deeply enough or, um, or see how it might be related to some of the other underlying structures. So in these cases, I do find um, cross-sectional imaging to be really helpful. Uh, it's one where, because it would be very unusual to need to consider removing the whole thyroid gland, CT would be potentially appropriate. Although you can also use MRI if that's easily available where you are. Um, some people will perform a swallow study for these, like a barium or gastrographin swallow, although a negative swallow is not going to rule out a piriform sinus fistula. So I typically would rather just do a DL if I want to diagnose this. Um, many patients would require laryngoscopy to formally diagnose. Sometimes you can get a good view into the piriform in the office if you're really able to get the patient to kind of hold their nose and valsalva while you've got the scope in there, but not always. So uh, the view that you get intraoperatively is certainly a little bit better. <clears throat> 
So when you talk about surgery for patients like this, you know, certainly you want to think about the prior surgeries they've had, what kind of scar tissue they might have, or uh, how planes might be distorted. Um, you want to know if there's an active cyst at the time of surgery or not. In this patient, as you can see from the scan, she just has this kind of fistulous tract sitting there uh, without a big collection. And then you would want to know the extent of the connection from the piriform to the thyroid. Some piriform sinus fistulas are very tiny and some are quite large. And so the way you manage them might be a bit different. And you can see here the fistulous tract, you've got this kind of um, higher signal here on your T1 right next to the left thyroid lobe. So in terms of management, uh, you do want to try to resolve the acute infection. I would not recommend operating in the presence of acute infection if you're able to stop it otherwise. Um, I've had IR drainage or, um, or I, I've done IND occasionally if they have a very, very large abscess that you can't get to resolve with antibiotics alone in advance of more definitive surgery, and that's okay. Um, certainly, you know, it's always nice when we don't have to do an IND prior to surgery, but sometimes you just can't help it. If you've got a three, four cent your collection, then you're not going to get away with the antibiotics alone on that. Some of these patients that are frequently infected, I have put on prophylactic antibiotics leading up to surgery to help prevent recurrent infection. And then you do always want to check a TSH. Um, since they've had a lot of inflammation infection in the area, that can be helpful for wound healing, right? If you need to supplement them there. So when it comes to surgery, you want to confirm that diagnosis with the laryngoscopy, and you do have to treat both the fistula in the piriform sinus as well as the lesion in the neck. Um, there are times when it can be sufficient to only treat the fistula. If you have a, uh, either a passively collapsed tract in the neck or a very small non-infected fluid collection, I have seen it work to just treat the fistula and leave the um, small, you know, pathway or, or collection in the neck alone, but larger cysts certainly you're going to have to remove. And I think you need to be prepared and prepare your patient adequately to do a hemithyroid for these cases. So um, again, we have a 15 year old with these multiply recurring abscesses intimately associated with the gland, oral flora on her cultures, and then this draining wound down here. So pretty compelling diagnosis, even without seeing laryngoscopy. We were not surprised when it came to surgery. Um, this is her actual laryngoscopy, where you can see her esophageal opening here, and this is her pure form, where it doesn't have that nice little pouch here, but instead has a, instead has a pathway extending deep down into the neck. So with these, the way that I will usually treat them is with a bug bee um, cautery electrode. So it's the one that urology oftentimes uses, but it's a tiny little wire with a cautery tip and you can thread it down into the pathway and do some judicious cautery there. And you do have to be mindful of the fact that just behind the larynx is going to sit your, you know, recurrent laryngeal nerve out here somewhere. So uh, you don't want to overdo it with your cautery, but typically just some cautery is okay. Uh, I have heard of patient or have heard of people putting to seal or fibrin glues in there. I haven't, um, but um, you know, cautery alone oftentimes is enough to seal it off. And then she had an external approach at the same time with excision of the sinus tract in continuity with the left lobe of the thyroid and has done well. All right, so from here, we're gonna go on to nodules, just cause that's, I think, the, the kind of bulk of the discussion here. So this was a 14 year old who came to see me really just for allergy and nasal congestion and had a thyroid nodule picked up on physical exam, about a two centimeter nodule. So we have some options, right? Um, in the adult world, you might reevaluate the nodule in a few months, you might check a TSH, you might request an ultrasound. You could order a, a CT or an MRI since it's a little bit larger. You could order a biopsy, right? In this patient, uh, initially started with a TSH and an ultrasound. Uh, I think 
in a larger size nodule, if you're pretty confident in your exam, you could consider going immediately to FNA. But um, I think I like to personally just start with the, the regular ultrasound because if it turns out it looks like just a colloid cyst, even if it's large, you might be um, just leaving it alone. So we know that thyroid nodules are present in about 2% of kids, um, some palpable, some incidentally noted. Um, but by the time we get to adolescence, that percentage goes way up. So uh, especially in females, you can see them in about 13% of adolescents. Um, we have some high-risk patients that we do screen for thyroid pathology, and those are primarily our childhood cancer survivors, who, uh, especially those who have been treated with radiation. And then some of our syndromic patients uh, also may be screened or followed for these nodules or for um, potential generation of nodules. So I think the big point uh, here is that in children, thyroid nodules are much more likely to be malignant than they are in adults. Uh, and then we know that children presenting with thyroid cancer are much more likely to have um, disease external to the thyroid upon presentation than our adults. Right? So they may come to you with an actual visible, visible or palpable lump. Um, occasionally they present with uh, endocrinologic symptoms, right, of hyper or hypothyroidism. Uh, dysphagia, voice change, breathing difficulty are much less common, although I have had all of those as presenting symptoms. Uh, and then sometimes we'll just pick them up incidentally, you know, especially in our brain tumor population when they're getting uh, screening after they've been definitively treated every now and then we'll pick up thyroid lesions um, on their sagittal exams that happen to come all the way down through the neck. So um, ultrasound, same as adults, is the imaging modality of choice. Now that comes with a, a bit of an asterisk in that you need to work with your local ultrasound team to make sure they understand how to do a good ultrasound of the thyroid or thyroid concerns in children. I know we've done a lot of work with our radiology department on developing synoptic reporting for thyroid nodules here and on automatically triggering lateral neck ultrasound when the tech finds a solid nodule in the thyroid bed. That's not something that's very commonly done. And so oftentimes you'll get these ultrasound reports back where you request an ultrasound of the thyroid, they tell you all about the nodule and that's it. You know, no one says anything about the neck, nobody interrogated the lateral neck, then you might be having to send patients back to go get an evaluation for lymphadenopathy. So if you think pediatric thyroid disease is gonna be a big part of your practice, I think it really pays to develop a good relationship with your ultrasound team uh, and work with them a bit on how you can streamline some of those um, diagnostic needs. So Tyreg's criteria are used in children the same as they are in adults where they sort of look at vascularity, microcalcifications, um, you'll see, you'll see um, delineation of the width and height of the lesion where they talk about taller than wide or wider than tall. Um, that is usually done on an axial view uh, and can have implication for whether or not a nodule could be malignant. And much in the same way you would on cross-sectional imaging to look at sort of the irregularity of the borders, potential infiltrative characteristics. If you have a solid nodule, then that lateral neck ultrasound does become much more important. If that shows a lot of uh, lymphadenopathy, then uh, cross-sectional imaging might come into play. Um, you have to remember to really use caution with studies that would require iodinated contrast because that can have implications for when you can subsequently give radioactive iodine. So if somebody gets evaluated with a CT with contrast, you find they have thyroid cancer, do their surgery, you're really going to be pushed back about eight weeks uh, in terms of when you could potentially do their radioactive iodine. So FNA, right? Uh, in the past, I would say that FNA is not used very often in kids because there's this sort of feeling that, hey, if I'm going to have to sedate the patient for a biopsy, then I might as well just anesthetize them and do a lobectomy. 
right? And we'll talk a little bit more about this in some coming slides, but uh, the, the ATA guidelines really are trying to encourage more use of FNA in kids um, because that can increase the chances that you're gonna do the right surgery for the patient the first time. Uh, the Bethesda scoring criteria are used for pediatric FNA, but um, we'll see that they do have slightly different chance of malignancy based on the classification, the Bethesda class. So classically, nodules greater than a centimeter, suspicious findings, documented enlargement, or um, are all candidates for biopsy, although size alone um, because in kids, the gland can be smaller, size alone should not be the only criteria used, right? So just because you're under one centimeter, if you have some of these other concerning findings, you may still consider an FNA in children. Also really important to remember that a diffusely enlarged gland um, or um, heterogeneous gland in patients that have lateral cervical lymphadenopathy can also be an indication for biopsy. Um, PTC can present in an infiltrative form in children that really just has the whole gland sort of heterogeneously involved. So that can be another, another tip. So in red here are highlighted the, um, this is from a, a 2016 study looking at just results in children. So the black numbers are chance of malignancy in adults, and then those red numbers are chance of malignancy in children. And so you can really see that um, that kind of progression of increasing chance of malignancy is maintained, but at an even higher percentage in the more concerning biopsy categories. So um, in some of these patients in adults, these indeterminate patients where you may have considered a repeat FNA, especially if you end up in this suspicious for malignancy category, that's really somewhere where we wouldn't recommend an FNA and would just say proceed straight to surgery. Most pediatric FNAs are gonna be done under ultrasound guidance just to increase, uh, improve the accuracy. Some kids require sedation, some kids don't if you topically anesthetize them well enough. And um, there are places that are doing this in the office even for a lot of kids. Um, so I think uh, with some dedication and creativity, a lot of it can get done in a way that is relatively benign for the patients and not nearly as big of a deal as going for a diagnostic lobectomy. Ideally, uh, you do want to assess the specimen in real time just for adequacy uh, to help make sure you minimize the number of non-diagnostic specimens that you get, right? Because you really can't do anything with that information. So this is the same information, but just kind of presented in a flow chart from straight from the ATA guidelines, right? It's a little bit busy, but basically if you're concerned, especially in a hypofunctioning solid nodule, um, that's when you would get your FNA, right? Malignant is easy, benign is easy. And then these sort of inadequate or indeterminate specimens trickle down through, oh, sorry there, trickle down through a little bit of further management, um, with potential for surgery if you end up in that indeterminate or suspicious range. So I think it's nice to think about, um, you know, say you're gonna stick on the sort of old, older school of care and do a lobectomy, right? If you do a lobectomy and the patient had cancer, because the vast majority of kids actually have papillary cancer, right? If you do a lobectomy and they had cancer, then you basically gave too much care or too little care and if you do a lobectomy and it was benign, then you gave too much care. So the only time that a lobectomy is the right care in kids is if they have a follicular lesion or an you know, uh, non-malignant lesion. And so that's where we really wanna move away from that as a form of um, sort of diagnosis and treatment. I do wanna say a word about molecular testing. Let me just check time here. All right, we're doing fine. Um, molecular testing is being used more and more frequently, uh, and I think it, is, it has a great role in kids in some cases, but it's important to understand what the different types of molecular tests are and therefore whether or not they're appropriate for use in kids. So the oncogene testing, um, that is the tests that are looking for mutations or translocations in oncogenes, right? So these are fusions, translocations, emissions that are typically seen in differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, 
So in children, RET PTC is going to be the most common, um, much more common than BRAF. RAS we see frequently, and then there's the PAX8 PPAR gamma oncogenes. Um, those are the commercial tests that are sold uh, and marketed under the names of Thyroseq, Thygenx, Thyramir. Um, those are just looking for oncogenes. Uh, so they're relatively specific, not necessarily sensitive, but relatively specific um, and, and relatively high sensitivity. So we don't need to do extra validation of those types of tests in pediatric patients, because if you have a cancer causing gene, you have a cancer causing gene, right? Um, now, this is different from gene expression classifier tests. I like to think about a gene expression classifier test as kind of like a big data test. So basically with those, what they're doing is looking at a big pool of mRNA, right? So looking at protein pool, and they're looking at where you see spikes that tend to correspond with the same kinds of spikes or signatures that you see in tumors. Um, it's a very different kind of test, right? It's basically looking at, hey, I see this little factor here, this factor here, this factor here, and if I have seven of these 10 factors, that's also commonly seen in thyroid cancer, right? That kind of test really does require pediatric validation because we don't know exactly which proteins should be expressed at different times and in what amounts in pediatric patients relative to adult patients. Um, so this is a FIRMA is the most common gene ex um, expression classifier test that's marketed right now. Um, you know, that one is one where I think it's potentially misleading to use in kids before we have more information. Um, and, uh, and really might not add a whole lot to your diagnosis or treatment planning at this point. Now, that's not to say we won't know more about that in the future, but at this point in time, I think you'd want to stick with the um, oncogene testing if you're going to, if you're going to go there. Um, the way it works at our hospital system is we'll typically do the FNA, draw um, an extra pass or two to hold in case that we do end up with an indeterminate result. And if we do, then try to send for the oncogene testing, um, assuming we can get insurance approval. Uh, the reason we don't just send it out for everybody is because they can be quite expensive and they're not always covered. Um, trying to get them covered or get them authorized can take a good bit of time. Uh, so we save the sample and only send in the setting where we think it's going to really impact our management. So when it comes to surgery, uh, again, important to know kids are not little adults, right? Surgical complication rates are just higher in kids. And that doesn't matter if you go to someone who's doing 100 thyroidectomies a year or if you go to someone who's doing one thyroid a year. Um, certainly higher volume is better. Uh, we know that in adults and we know that in kids, um, but complication rates are just higher. Um, kids' parathyroid glands are a little bit more twitchy and ten, the incidence of temporary hypocalcemia is much higher. Uh, we prep all of our families by letting them know that their, their calcium level is going to dip in the hospital. And part of our algorithm or order set for getting them out is really watching that dip. And then when we see them kind of coming back up uh, and have them stabilize on their oral regimen, can think about sending them home. Uh, the incidence of nerve injury is also higher in children. Uh, and so again, just need to have a serious discussion about the chance of these complications and, um, and understand that you know, adult practice doesn't translate directly into pediatric care. Uh, now, with adult literature, we know that that high volume cutoff is set somewhere in the nature of 25, 30 surgeries a year. There's just not that much thyroid cancer in kids. And so there's some active research underway to try to figure out where the high volume mark should be set. Uh, and to try to figure out whether or not other surgical experience in the neck would kind of contribute to that volume number. 
but I think in the meantime, really, it's the type of thing that most most places with a active thyroid center are trying to consolidate those surgeries amongst a few surgeons only and really try to keep everyone's um, skills very fresh and uh, practice numbers up. So what can we do to prevent hypocalcemia? Um, subcapsular dissection, so really getting right on the gland, uh, sometimes inside the capsule, which can be a little bit bloodier, but um, can increase your, your chances of really preserving that vascular su supply to the glands. Um, Reimplantation of devascularized glands. If you get to the end of the case and you've got a really dark purple pair sitting out there, then you really might want to consider reimplanting those. Uh, typically, that's done in the SCM for most of our patients. We tend to mark the area with clips in case we're ever to need to get back there again. Um, but within a few months, those will typically pick up and function again. Uh, with both pediatric and adult patients, you want to ensure they have um, adequate vitamin D levels to make sure that they're making good use of the calcium precursors and, um, and um, vitamin D precursors that they have. PTH monitoring is important. Uh, some places will do this intraoperatively, uh, and if not, then in a protocolized way postoperatively with much more frequent lab draws than you would typically see in adults. Uh, I know our order set is uh, every six hour draws in that first 12 to 24 hours, depending on where the PTH lands postoperatively and where the calcium levels seem to bottom out. Uh, with sort of stage intervention, based on where it looks like you're headed with your calcium. Um, we do try as much as possible to avoid IV calcium supplementation just because of the potential complications there uh, and because it tends to be short acting a little bit harder to stabilize. Uh, but that can mean lots of oral calcium, right? If you end up with really low levels or really low PTH, you can have kids on lots and lots and lots of Tums. So um, it's important consideration it can sometimes lead to some interesting challenges once they go home with trying to get them to to chew and swallow that much supplemental calcium that many times a day. Uh, most of our patients are started on calcitriol. Uh, that can be quickly weaned afterwards if it's not necessary, uh, but we do tend to start it for patients and just um, try to help keep things as stable as possible right after surgery. And then, you know, you get to remember that you may need to adjust your dosing a bit in grades patients. Um, supplementation of both calcium and thyroid hormone is managed by our endocrine colleagues in the outpatient setting. Again, rapid tapering in some patients that can tolerate it and slower in patients who may have significant lateral neck disease or more advanced surgery done. This is an area that's really right for QI protocols and implementation if you don't already have standardization of this post-op care at your institution. And um, certainly happy to discuss with anybody if you wanna reach out about that afterwards. So when it comes to nerve injuries and nerve monitoring, uh, we do give all of our patients a pre op or intra -op steroid dose. Um, I think most surgeons would agree that systematic dissection and identification is the, excuse me, the best way to present, prevent injury in pediatric cases. The nerve can be quite tiny, even in some of our adolescents. And so it's good to just keep an open mind about structures until you have confirmed diagnosis of where it is. Um, anything that looks like a candidate should be left alone. Um, we use nerve monitoring electrodes and endotracheal tubes um, you know, evidence would suggest that that does not reduce injury, um, but it does, I think, allow the ability to confirm integrity of the nerve at the end of the case, which can be quite nice, and um, allows confirmation of integrity of the nerve before you move to the contralateral side. So if you had a really challenging dissection or what looked to be potential tumor invasion, in some cases, you may elect to stop the case after that hemi, you know, and you're not getting good signaling from your monitor, you might stop the case after that hemithyroid and you know, see what's going on in terms of functioning of the larynx before you move on to the contralateral side. Um, we had a recent case of a transient nerve palsy 
where that was done by the surgeon, uh, there was a really challenging dissection on the tumor side and he elected to stop the case after that side. Sure enough, the patient had a palsy resolved after about eight weeks uh, and then he got booked for his completion thyroidectomy. Um, but that just really minimizes the chance that you have a patient waking up with a bilateral paralysis requiring some intervention that you wish you didn't have to do. Um, uh, signs and symptoms of a nerve paralysis afterwards are fairly typical, right? Strider on awakening certainly is one. Um, hoarseness that lasts beyond that first 24 to 48 hours that you could try to associate with just the um, ET tube being there. And then I think the more you listen, the more you are able to recognize the difference between the kind of scratchy throat from having had an ET tube versus that real subtle diplophonia or breathiness that you might get from having a nerve out. We do try to confirm those complaints with laryngoscopy before patients leave the hospital just so we have a good idea of our own complication rates and so that we can monitor for improvement both in terms of symptoms and function. Uh, if you have a unilateral nerve injury, uh, we would, you know, in most cases, just simply observe, wait for a resolution. If you're, especially if you're relatively confident about the integrity of the nerve, there is potentially some benefit for post-op steroid use. Um, I think literature on that is still emerging, but there's some suggestion it might be beneficial. Uh, and in a few patients who seem really severely affected, even in terms of their, either in terms of their voice quality or their swallowing, uh, consider an injection laryngoplasty before they go home to try to help a bit. Um, bilateral cord paralysis, obviously the management there is a little bit more invasive. Some patients can be managed conservatively. Oftentimes, um, because it's very abrupt, uh, you have to kind of, if you're going to be able to manage them conservatively, you may have to put them on uh, non-invasive for a little while, like a BiPAP or CPAP, kind of help them uh, get accustomed to the new increased resistance in their breathing. Um, if you, if that's not enough, then chordotomy or arytenoidectomy can be pursued endoscopically, depending on your level of confidence in, in one or both of those nerves coming back. Um, trach is always an option and certainly on your oral boards is always an option that needs to be mentioned. We try to avoid that as much as possible, but there are times when it cannot be avoided, certainly. So this is a patient who had a temporary paresis after surgery. The, the, even though um, with this exam, you would probably assume that the right nerve was infected. It's actually the left. I think it just has a bit to do with the angle that the telescope is taking. And so when you inject, when you do an injection laryngoplasty, you're going to come out here just lateral to the thyroid muscle, and you're really trying to fill this space here, um, the kind of paraglottic space, to push the cord over. You ideally do not want the injection material getting into that superficial lamina propria. You don't want it to be affecting the uh, vibratory capacity of the vocal cord. Um, but you can see afterwards how this left side is shifted much closer to the midline so that we can hopefully get better approximation from the right. Um, this little dip back here near the vocal process is not a place that you can really do a ton about in terms of your injections. Um, really, you're, you're going to work kind of as posteriorly as you can up in this space. Um, but this was able to give the patient um, the ability to drink fine without any um, symptoms of aspiration and gave her some better voice quality while she waited on function to come back, which it did um, I usually tell patients to expect two to three months. Sometimes it comes sooner, um, but usually it is a little bit slow. Uh, and so I think if you set a long-term time frame, it tends to lead to a little bit less dissatisfaction. All right, so, you know, why did we develop pediatric guidelines? The main reason there is that um, there's a history, especially in this country and in, in a lot of places in Europe, of overtreatment, right? Children are generally pretty unlikely to die of thyroid cancer, even those who present with significant either lateral neck disease or mediastinal metastases. You know, up to 45% of people with the pulmonary mediastinal metastases are going to develop stable, persistent disease. Uh, and 
in staging, most of these patients are going to end up highest at about a stage two, even if they have a high risk tumor. So if we're ablating all of these kids with radioactive iodine, then we're kind of overdoing it, right? We also know that pediatric patients, because they have a longer time to live with the consequences of their therapy, have a higher chance of seeing a secondary malignancy caused by their radioactive iodine. So um, again, for this patient, they've got an adolescent with a two centimeter nodule asymptomatic. Her age and gender kind of put her in a higher risk group. Uh, we know that her function needs to be assessed and that the biopsy, or I'm sorry, the nodule required size, biopsy by size criteria. So her initial ultrasound was pretty consistent with physical exam, about a two centimeter nodule, um, but just solid and relatively homogeneous. Um, no other lymphadenopathy was noted, but her FNA was positive for papillary. Lateral neck ultrasound was completely normal. So she underwent a total thyroidectomy with a central compartment dissection. Um, I think she had one or two positive nodes in the central compartment. And so she did and did have a tiny bit of um, residual uptake there in the thyroid bed on her whole body postoperative scan. So she was treated with RAI. If we have patients where we've excised the nodule, the nodule doesn't have any significant capsular or um, angio invasion, lymphovascular uh, invasion, and the central compartment nodes are negative, then those are candidates for observation without the RAI. <coughs> No question? All right, so other surgical indications. Um, we do have some patients, oh, we're getting short on time. So some patients have symptomatic goiter. Graves disease is a surgical indication a little bit more frequently in kids than in adults, both because it can be harder to obtain full response and because of the higher chance of relapse. Um, so I'm gonna zip through a couple of these so we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, our medullary patients are specific population, obviously a smaller group, but specific. Um, and they now, rather than grouping simply into these three main groups of 2A, 2B, and familial medullary thyroid cancer, we're getting into an area of um, codon-specific recommendations. So um, based on the relative risk associated with different codon mutations, um, some of these are high, considered higher risk, like, and some of them are considered lower risk. And so when you choose to surgically intervene might be based on the risk profile of the actual mutation. So this is the place where we're really making some progress with individualized medicine and genetic testing. Um, the, the farther out you can delay the surgery, then the lower your risk of complication. So that's why you'd wanna take this kind of more uh, phased approach. However, I will say it's hard to find a family where you tell them that they're their kid is gonna get thyroid cancer for sure one day and they wanna delay surgery. So all of this is um, you know, done in the context of uh, family discussion, right? All right, so um, we'll skip this. All right, so to summarize, right, ectopic thyroid tissue can be found anywhere along the path of descent, but really most commonly in the tongue. We only have to operate on lingual thyroid tissue if it's causing symptoms, right? Uh, we talked about recurrent separative thyroiditis and the association with third and fourth branchial anomalies or piriform sinus fistulas and how we might manage that. And we went through nodules in pediatric patients, appropriate workup and judicious use of surgery when required. Um, with, you know, and discussing this kind of all within the context of the pediatric care guidelines. So I think we want to really balance in our pediatric care the risk of the pathology with the risk of the treatment that we're providing. And remember that our, our care over the long term can be associated with some harm. And so that's where the guidelines came into place uh, to try to make sure that we're in better balance with those two. All right, I think that's it for us. So this is our team here at Emory um, who contributes to our care. And if anyone has questions, you can either send them in via chat or um, if there are not too many, then we can probably just discuss them orally.
Anybody? All right, we got one here. Can, okay, so I have one that says, can you talk briefly about malignancy found in ectopic thyroid tissue as to what steps you would take in surveillance? So that's a great question and sort of an interesting one. Um, there is certainly an incidence of malignancy in ectopic tissue uh, and a little bit of argument in terms of what you ought to do about it. Uh, I think the most commonly written about is um, malignancy contained within a thyroglossal duct cyst. Every now and then you'll uh, remove a thyroid, uh, thyroglossal and find papillary inside it. And so literature-based recommendations for that would suggest that if you have a totally normal thyroid gland and the papillary was fully contained within the thyroglossal duct cyst, that you don't necessarily need to remove the thyroid. Um, Obviously, if you leave the gland in place, you can't monitor thyroglobulin, and you're going to have to be doing relatively frequent surveillance of the gland in the postoperative period to make sure that you don't see a tumor developing there that could have been maybe microscopic or not picked up by imaging that was the source. But most people agree that if the only site of disease is within a thyroglossal duct cyst, there's no lateral neck lymphadenopathy, then it's likely a primary of that location and therefore not a metastasis. Therefore, the thyroid gland does not need to be removed. Now, with that caveat, I will say that I took care of a patient who had um, a really sort of nasty infiltrative cancer in a thyroglossal duct cyst. Um, so kind of up here in the submental region and because it was clearly invasive into some of the surrounding musculature in that patient we did elect to do a thyroidectomy and treat with radioactive iodine um, because it was pretty clear that there was some microscopic spread of disease. So I think in lingual thyroid you'd be in the same situation. That's really something that you're going to find case reports about I think only. Uh, so if the if there is a gland and the gland is entirely normal, then I think it would be reasonable to follow the patient with surveillance ultrasounds, as long as there's no cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, but if you have either evidence of uh, lateral neck disease or nodules in the gland itself, then uh, I think you would want to treat that in a way that would allow you to potentially deliver that radioactive iodine. Great question. All right, well, thanks everyone for your attention. I hope you're all hanging in there. And um, I think I'll be back here in a couple of weeks to talk about some fetal issues. All right, take care. Thank you, Dr. Prickett. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wick, I think I've made you a co-host. So in just a moment, you should be able to share your screen.